Chapter 26 The summer I graduated from high school, my sister princess planned to marry. She had met a lovely man from our tribe, and she decided to hold the wedding in Rwanda. I was excited to see Africa again, and to see my grandparents for the first time since I was a baby. I had been so young when I last saw them in the mountains of South Kivu, where my parents grew up that I could not remember them. As my family planned a trip back to our homeland, I began to think about visiting a refugee camp. So many of my people were stuck in camps in Rwanda, displaced and stateless, living out their lives in tents. Some had reached out to me on Facebook, gaining access to computers wherever they could, like at internet cafes in nearby towns. I imagined that it took them forever to walk to those towns, and then they would have to find a way to pay for the internet access. I wanted to connect. I floated the idea to my mom one afternoon while we were making tea in our kitchen. I tried to keep the conversation light, as I do when I say something mom won't like. She looked bewildered. Why would you want to go back to a refugee camp? She asked. What if you have a mental breakdown? It was a fair question. I might have a meltdown. Mom probably didn't think I was serious. I would never go back to a camp, she said. I could understand that. She had been shot during the massacre, left for dead. She managed to walk away, but her youngest child did not. She continued to cook, and I stopped talking about it. Mom didn't want to remember that hell. Me, I felt differently. Memories of Deborah and the massacre haunted me, lurking in the back of my mind. I wanted to conquer that fear. I wanted to visit a camp like the one where my family was attacked, to face down my past and see my people forgotten by the world. Here in America, I had hope. I had a scholarship for college in the fall where I would live on a beautiful campus, studying subjects I love. In America, I had books and a bed to sleep on. I had a future. The night the men held a gun to my head, I thought I had no future. On that night, I said goodbye to my life. It's important to remember. And also, it didn't feel right to stay away from a refugee camp because someone had attacked my family. People living in these isolated places need to know the outside world cares. I decided that the only way my attackers could claim victory over me was if I let fear rule my life. So I made up my mind. I would go back to a camp. Princess and Adele said they would go with me. They felt the same as I did. We picked a UN refugee camp near Kigali, the capital of Rwanda where many of my people have been displaced due to conflict in Congo. My sisters and I wanted to go by ourselves, not in any official capacity with an organization, just as arriving as friends, not foreigners. We planned to quietly visit the camp and talk with people about their lives. But my mother's concerns were valid. I didn't know if I would be able to cope. There was a chance I would panic when I saw the camp I need to turn right around. I had no idea how I would feel in that moment, but I knew one thing. I needed to find out. When we landed in Kigali, I could see immediately that things had changed. Paved roads and highways stretched before us. There was a glossy new airport, towering skyscrapers. The city had evolved since I had last seen it. During those impoverished years when we lived in Rwanda after the massacre. Back then, more than five years earlier, the capital city was mired in corruption with crumbling roads and buildings, slums in the middle of the city. Now on the city streets, the kids looked like American kids, busy with their cell phones, scrolling through Twitter and Facebook. Yet a few hours outside their city, Children are living in a different universe, a refugee camp where water is the prized possession. Before my sisters and I went to the camp, 
Mom warned us to be careful. Don't spend the night, she said. She didn't understand why we were going, but she didn't try to stop us. To get to the camp, my sisters and I took an early morning bus across the countryside, passing vast green valleys and hills, miles of tea fields, roadside vendors with baskets of fruit, boxy rural homes made of clay and cement. I remembered my own yellow home back when I was a girl in Ovira, where I played in a yard with my pet monkey. I loved seeing Africa again, speaking Swahili, not having to think about whether I was using the right words in English. There is something incredibly relaxing about Africa to me. Americans are always moving, always going somewhere, even if they have nothing important to do when they get there. In Africa, you're generally home with your family, telling stories, making fun of one another, laughing. The bus ride was long, and it reminded me of how isolated the refugee camps are. They are completely removed from society. Some three bumpy hours later, we got off at a dusty corner. Men on motorbikes were hanging around by the side of the road, waiting to give people rides up the mountainside to the refugee camp. We agreed to pay a trio of young men to take us to the camp, and they handed us helmets. My sisters and I got on the backs of the bikes and sped away, holding on to our drivers. It was the last week of July, dry and dusty, and I could feel the sun burning my skin. My jeans were soon covered in dust, my purple boots brown. I covered my mouth with a scarf to protect myself from the dust. The road was so rugged my helmet flew off when we went over a bump, and I had to hop off to retrieve it. Vendors dotted the roadside, staring as we passed. We had to stop and walk a few times, traversing rickety wooden bridges stretching across ponds. Women washed clothes in the ponds. Children collected the water. My mind flew back to a memory of myself fetching water as a girl in the camp, but I didn't have time to think about it. We were heading toward an ominous rocky mountain that looked like it went up into the clouds. As we hit the mountainside and drove higher and higher, my driver had to get off the bike sometimes and push it over the terrain. When I got back on the bike with him, I worried that we could roll backward, tumbling down the hill. I held on tight. We made it to the camp, which was filled with tents as far as I could see. People walked toward us, eyeing us curiously, and I felt something different from what I had expected. Seeing the faces of my people, I experienced a rush of sudden joy. They all looked just like me. Even though they had never met me, they seemed to know me. They were my people. I didn't need to explain anything about myself like I do in America. My accent, my homeland, my heritage. They spoke my language, Kinyamlenge. They welcomed me because I was one of them. I was home. At the same time, they seemed to know right away that we were from another world. Children ran up to us, staring and trailing us like we were celebrities. I had expected to blend in, but there was something that set us apart. On the faces of the people around us, I could see a universal expression among the young and old, a look of hopelessness, a sense of resignation. This camp was their universe and they had accepted that. My sisters and I had arrived with hope in our eyes. We looked different. The sounds and memories of my own childhood refugee camp came rushing back. Children playing, pots banging, women cooked on clay stoves outside, babies cried. Camp officials, we learned from a group of teenage boys, were in the midst of a drug cleansing that day. Outsiders had brought drugs to the camp to sell them to young men. How awful, I thought, for drug dealers to try to get poor people hooked on drugs. The officials walked around the camp, burning the drugs in front of people. There were kids playing dodgeball with makeshift balls made of wadded up plastic shopping bags tied together with shoelaces. 
The same kinds of balls we played with as kids. I hadn't thought about those balls in years. Outside a tent, a young girl in a pink t-shirt and a long skirt dutifully swept the entrance with a broom. Hello, I said, walking up to her. I'm Sandra. What is your name? Francine, she said. And how old are you? Thirteen. She had short hair, like I did as a girl, and it sent me soaring back to my childhood again. I saw myself in Francine. I was a little younger than her when I was in the camp, and she carried herself as I did. She didn't talk much, unlike the other kids who brazenly followed us around the camp. She told me it was her job to do chores for the family, like caring for her little brother and fetching water each morning from the public fountain. She said she had lived in the camp for seven years, more than half her life. She told me she went to school, walking an hour up and down the hill each way to get there. And I was glad to hear it. What do you want to do when you finish school? I asked. I don't know, she said as if she had never thought about it. I pressed her. Surely you must dream of something. She couldn't think of one single thing she wanted. She had no dreams. I encouraged her to think about what interested her and what she might want to do when she grows up. Finally, after some thought, she said maybe she could be a nurse in the camp one day, caring for children. She couldn't visualize a life outside the camp. I told her, you know, you could be a nurse in a hospital in the city or somewhere beyond the camp. She couldn't imagine it. That was a world she did not know. Your life doesn't have to be here, I said. It doesn't have to end here. My eyes welled up at the thought of it. She noticed and watched me curiously. She must have thought I was crazy. We walked together for a few minutes and then she had to return home to her chores. I took pictures of the two of us, thanked her for talking with me, and said goodbye. It broke my heart a little to see her walk away. Across the way, a woman who looked a little younger than my mother welcomed us into her tent. Inside, there was no furniture, just mats on the ground for sleeping. Curtains served as walls between rooms. She said she had lived there for several years, along with her children. She asked if I wanted any water or food, and the offer could not have been more generous. There, water is the best gift you can give, a precious commodity. It is the difference between life and death, not something you drink at your leisure. To get water, people have to walk about 30 minutes down a hill to the fountain, stand in line, fill a bucket, and walk back. I accepted the water because it would have been rude to say no. Then I let my mind take me back to my own tracks for water as a girl in the refugee camp in Gatumba. The long lines, the fights, the bullies pushing me to the end of the line. I remembered how I longed to return to school. Back then, I never imagined how my life would change. As we continued to walk around the camp, a man kept staring at us. He seemed to recognize us, but I had never seen him before. He stopped us and spoke to Princess. Murawa Navara Haiti, he said. Are you Rachel's children? Ye go, Princess replied. Yes. Yo, he exclaimed. I tried to recall his face. Dignokorome, he said. I'm your uncle. Nibjo, Princess asked. Is that so? In our culture, if someone says you're related, even if you don't know the person, you respond with respect. We smiled and listened to him. I don't think anyone recognized him, not even Adele, who usually knows everyone. He told us that his father and my grandpa are brothers. He said he had been close to my mother in Congo. He didn't know how many of us had survived the attack. He had heard that mom had lost some of her children. He hugged us tightly, then took us inside his home and offered us some food. And again, 
I was transported back to Gatumba, reliving the tasteless food, the confined spaces. Our uncle told us stories of our mother and introduced us to his family. I wanted so badly to remove them from the camp. I could imagine all the fear, isolation, and hopelessness they must be feeling. No one deserves to watch life pass them by in a camp. The day moved too quickly into evening, and it was time to go. Say hello to your mom, my uncle told us. Tell her you saw your uncle. She will know exactly who you are talking about. My sisters and I said farewell to all of our new friends. A sentimental moment as we were leaving them behind. We roared back down the mountainside on motorbikes, and a bus eventually rolled up crowded with dozens of people. We squished ourselves into the seats, exhausted from the day. I thought about how when you grow up in a refugee camp, you don't know how terrible the camp is because you have never known anything better. I thought about Francine, the girl with no dreams. She wasn't growing up expecting things like basic human rights, a real home, or a future. As night fell over the hushed, shadowy hills of the countryside, I thought of the women in the camp, spending their days cooking with corn and rice, tending to their children, gossiping about camp life. I thought of their husbands, desperately seeking day labor in the city, trying to find any work that they could. I thought about how my family had been resettled because of the massacre. Officials were worried about retaliation after the attack. And so we were given an opportunity to leave the country and start anew. If it hadn't been for the massacre, I could still be living in a camp like that. But also, if it hadn't been for the massacre, I would still have my sister Deborah. My sisters and I sat silently on the bus as warm, dusty air blew in through the windows. We had wanted to record a cell phone video to document our feelings about our experiences that day. But there were no words. 